So as I said, we're going to have Margaret Make Peace and Penny Brook from the British Library speaking as well, who are not only going to be talking about the scope of the collection, but showing us a few key documents as well. So really showing you a few examples of, of the material that, that your scholars are going to be able to find or, or you're going to be able to find uh, when, you're, when you're using this archive, you know, fully digitized for the first time. So let's let's get started. I said I was going to quickly show you around, um, give you an idea of the scope of co the collection, and show you really how to use it. You know, this is this is slightly different from um, from some of our other collections in in the way that uh, one should use it. So I, I really want to kind of make that clear. So first of all, I've already mentioned that we're going to have Margaret and Penny on board. Um, now this is as you probably guessed, a single project. This is all four separate classes from the India Office uh, Archive at the British Library. Um, so this is really just about the background to the archive and, and how the British Library have stored it and kind of uh, preserved it. And I'm sure some of you uh, or many of you know uh, you know, British uh, Empire scholars or or even, you know, South Asianists that have been to the British Library and used this collection. It really is, you know, the backbone to, um, you know, material relating to the East India uh, Archive, right from 1600 through to 1947, once, once India gained uh, independence. So... Um, should you want to really kind of get into the nitty-gritty of, of what's in this, I would come to the nature and scope in the introduction. That's where I've just clicked. And what you'll be able to see here is each of those four classes that I, I just discussed, these are really kind of, in quote, the, the backbone for this East India Company uh, archive. Um, so A, I-O-R-A, uh, is the Charter Statutes and Treaties. Um, B and D, I would really class together because these are these are both uh, sets of minutes uh, from uh, the Court of Directors, and then more kind of, kind of oh, and then more general um, kind of offices within the East India, sometimes provincial, sometimes uh, you know smaller bodies of people uh, working on a particular administrative function uh, in, a, in a particular province, perhaps. So B and D, uh, they can really be classed together because they actually have indexes um, for for the majority of the material, and this is going to become this is important, and that will become apparent apparent why, uh, particularly when you are you know searching for materials. You know, there is a vast amount of manuscript material here, so having those indexes for classes B and classes D, we can see here, very important. And the third class is uh, C, which is the Minutes and Memoranda for the Council uh, of India. So that, that's really the, the classes, um, an overview of those. So what kind of documents would we expect to find in here? Well, minutes of council meetings is pretty obvious. And within those come memoranda and papers and notes that were perhaps passed between directors uh, during, uh, during board meetings resolutions that came from these meetings, legislations, as well as charters, account books, uh, correspondence between uh, various members of the company. And should you want a kind of really uh, granular breakdown of each of these classes, you can, you can view those here. We've really tried to put, uh, make an effort to digitize this material within the format that, the, that is laid out in um, at the British Library, so the research experience is, is very similar, and everything's in quote where it should be, as it were. So, uh, just before I hand over to Kate, I'm just going to show you a few different ways to browse this material. So I've just clicked into the documents uh, button at the top here. I want to make that a little bit bigger. There we are. So the first thing we can do is browse volumes by era. Um, I'm going to show you a few different ways because you know, obviously different scholars from, from different levels of familiarity are going to be coming and, and using this material. So we can browse by era and we've kind of um, titled each of these. And if you click into that, it's going to refine it by date. We can refine it by class as we've already been through those classes with A being the charters and treaties and then B and D with those uh, sets of minutes and C 
uh, being the Council of India. Or you can just browse the indexes for classes B and classes D. So that might be a slightly quicker way to get through. Um, a you're looking for a, a particular person or a particular treaty or resolution that was passed. Maybe the index is a good starting place for that. Perhaps you've got, you know, 30 hours free to spare and you just want to stay up all night and browse the entire archive itself you can do that as well. Um, so if you just click into the list view, that's going to give you all of the material in one list. And here we can maybe, uh, you know, refine by date. So we could look for just material between 1695 and uh, 1700. I just want, uh, using the filters on the left-hand side here, I just want minutes and I just want memorandum. All you do is we've got our date in there, we select two document types. We can refine by class if we want to as well. And we can just apply those filters. So if we're looking for something particular, uh, we can do it that way. So that's one way to browse this. Um, I'm going to show you two other ways. Now, we're very aware that we want to make this material you know, accessible to not just top level scholars who are familiar with the British Library setup, but scholars who, who want to get into this area of study who, who maybe aren't that uh, familiar with, with this material at all. So we've built this chronology and we think this is a, hopefully a really useful tool for, for getting into the material, providing a jumping off point. So what we can do is we can filter down the chronology on the right hand side here so say we're, we're just interested in events relating to uh, education uh, religion people and uh, let's say health and that's going to populate our uh, chronology a bit more but say we're just interested in around the 1700 mark let's say here and then we're going to get key events relating to these themes we've picked on the right hand side um, we can refine by region as well. So if our project or our research is just refined to a particular province, uh, we, can, we can do that. We've also built, if I just uh, twizzle this down, we've also built these things called stories, which are really kind of mini exhibitions that sit within the chronology and hopefully provide you know, a bit more context and, um, and provide a nice starting point for, for the research into this material. So we can maybe look at the Anglo-Burmese wars. And say we do find an event um, that is of particular interest here. So um, here we are. So Anthony Weldon, all we do is click here. And then we're going to be able to view volumes and materials from this date in which you know, he was appointed a president uh, and governor of Fort William in Bengal. So I click down here and we can maybe look at these court minutes in particular. So that's, that's one way. And um, the other way, and we do have the slider at the top here, which I, I showed you earlier. I'm just going to come back to the documents list and just show you one more way that we can hopefully um, get to material if we're not that familiar. So for maybe lower level researchers, you know, even undergraduates, we think, um, will find that chronology useful. And hopefully they'll also find uh, this government structure chart a useful way to get to the material. So again, the, the chronology scroller at the top here is very similar. I'm going to keep Let's move to 1700 again. And this is really a breakdown of all the key offices and positions of power uh, within the, well, the Crown and the East India Company at various points uh, through, its, through its legacy. So say we're just interested in the 1700 mark and we are just interested in Bengal, like we saw earlier. We can click into uh, Charles Ayres. We can see he's the president from, these, from this year. Short bit of bio, and again, we can view the volumes from this particular date that he was appointed president. Oh, sorry, he, he uh, was serving as president of Bengal. 
again, we can maybe refine the months, uh, you know, February to, to August, if we really need to get down uh, to a slightly more refined list as well. Okay, uh, so there are three granted very quick ways uh, to view this view this material. Um, one thing I'm going to really quickly show you just before we move on to the data visualization is actually just show you uh, an example of, of some of these uh, minutes of the East India Company directors. So let's, let's apply a filter. Let's look at just 1695 to uh, 1700. Keep things consistent. Apply that filter. Again, we can see we're just viewing the IORB materials here. So these are just minutes. Let me click into a set of court minutes. You know, we can see the page, this, uh, the thumbnail scroller at the top here. Yeah, this is really helpful for just working out if there's you know blank pages or you know administrative pages that aren't that useful to us. Uh, we can pull the metadata down here. Again, a really useful class description of, of this particular class, which is B. Some notes as well from our editors, as these are all hand indexed. But what I really wanted to show you here. So we have all of our minutes listed here, and we also have our indexes on the right-hand side. So say, you know, we're keeping, uh, let's keep 1699 as, as, our, as our date. So say we're interested in minutes relating to these dates. We can zoom right in and view these word by word if we need to. These are all high quality scans, all full color. In order to make these a bit more um, sort of negotiable, what we've done is we've matched the index to every set of minutes. So say we're looking for someone particular uh, or, or an event that begins with the letter D. We can click to the letter D. And using the split screen, we can work out uh, you know, which page of the minutes this is going to appear in. So discharge of Mr. Savile, page 10. We do. Let's head to page 10. That's two page 10s, but let's find out. Again, our index is going to stay in exactly the same place. So you can see this is a this was a set of minutes from a meeting on 5th of June, 1695. I think it's the second page, 10. And there we are. Mr. Savile discharged. Uh, so page 10, as we saw here. So this is really going to allow us to navigate um, you know, these sets of minutes, these class B and these class D documents, like, like never before, as we have the, the indexes and the minutes digitally mapped, mapped up. Uh, for, well, for the first time ever, really. There, there was never a way to do this online before. Um, so this is going to be a really, well, hopefully, a much faster way to get uh, get through these minutes. And there are thousands of pages. So that's just a really quick guide on, on how to navigate the indexes with the minutes, as we've seen uh, already. Again, that doesn't take away from the chronology or the government structure chart. You know, they are also you know, really easy and valid ways to, to get to documents uh, that are of use to you as well. So the last thing I'm just going to touch on because I'm, I'm conscious of time, but um, this is something that uh, we've been working on with um, Professor Hugh Bowen at the University of Swansea. And we thought we wanted to take um, 
a lot of collated data about the East India Company's import and exports across its its legacy, really, right from, well, 1760 uh, is when our dates start, and we've collated the data to 1834. And I'm just going to quickly explain what this is. What we've done is we've collated all the import and export data from key markets um, across this, this date range here. I was just interested in uh, import, you know, East India imports and exports uh, from China between 1760 and uh, 1795. Hit enter. So you can see the 10 commodities and with, our, with the little buttons next to them here, the 10 commodities that were coming in and out of China on East India ships during this period of 1760. To 1795. On the right here, we have a bit of bio about uh, you know British East India trade within China. What we have here is total figures between this year periods uh, of imports and exports. But this is really the I suppose the key part of this map. So we can actually visualise the data year by year. We can see where the spikes are, where the drops are. And that's all I'm really going to say about this. And you know, we can break this down by by each of those commodities as well. And we can just look at a single commodity uh, being perhaps exported. So tea being exported from China between 1760 and 1795, and we can see how uh, you know the level of import and export changed over a particular period that we're interested in. Um, Again, I'm just going to leave that there. Um, if you do want to play around with that more, uh, do let me know either in the, in the chat box or, or get in touch with us and, and request a free trial because you know, I realize that's um, probably not the full extent of what this map can do and, and uh, we're a little short on time today. So that is it from me. Um, I'm now going to hand over, I'm just going to switch over to the chat window. So I'm now going to hand over Uh, to Dr. Kate Bohm from the University of Sussex. And as I mentioned at the start, Kate is going to really talk about um, an area of research, of, of her res recent research, um, which kind of uses the East India uh, material as, as a touchstone, really. Um, and we're going to be looking at, uh, towards the end of her talk, two treaties that do appear within uh, the East India uh, records uh, within this resource. So let's uh, hand over now. Okay, hello? Hi Kate. Hi, um, so today I thought I would speak just very briefly about my own research and the pivotal role that the India Office Records have held in my own work. So much of my research career has been concentrated upon the development of Indian business networks in and around Bombay during the middle decades of the 19th century. And specifically, I've sought to understand how the Indian business community of Western India leveraged long-standing networks of subterranean capital as well as personal and business connections with communities throughout Bombay's hinterlands to develop a dominant position within the Bombay commercial economy. Now, this kind of work requires a kind of dual aspect research approach. First, I must understand how those Indian firms conducted business, how they communicated, invested, and developed new projects. This entails understanding both the great firms of Bombay and the small-scale trade that proliferated throughout the region. Second, I must understand the socioeconomic context within which, this, within which this trade was conducted. This involves not only the politics of British commercial development in Western India, but also the regional banking culture, the banks, bazaars, and auctions that developed across the region, the infrastructure, including roads, waterways, and railways that facilitated trade. And most importantly, this requires an understanding of how these conditions varied across political lines between the princely states and British India. It is this last topic that I still continue to investigate, considering the economic integration of British and princely India. So I would therefore like to talk about how the different kinds of records available in the India office might be used in conjunction and have been employed by myself in my own research. So the India office records have played a consistently crucial role throughout my work. The wide variety of documentary evidence available has ensured support for both of these kind of dual approaches. And many of the resources I use have fallen 
but in particular under the East India Company's general correspondence. Um, and most importantly, this included the Indian presidency governments in Madras and Bombay. Correspondence with the presidency governments was then divided further into various departments. And for my purposes, I was particularly interested by correspondence from the public, financial, political and revenue departments of the Bombay presidency government. I also likewise have made considerable use of the factory records, in most particular official trading diaries and proceedings of revenue boards and provincial councils and other similar materials. Such sources have provided crucial insights into the working of municipal government in a colonial administration. They reveal the inner workings of the departments and the debates that shaped policy on the ground. For example, a minute of the revenue department of the Bombay government from 1849 included debates surrounding the levying of transit duties in and around the Bombay presidency. These minutes reveal the difficulties faced by the revenue department in enforcing transit duties upon goods traveling across colonial borders from the princely states. They likewise include debates concerning the rights of the Indian princes in the region to levy their own duties. One excerpt of this debate continued as follows, saying that we fully concur in the opinion expressed that if these duties are levied by the Gakar and other princes in the exercise of an ancient right of sovereignty, the British government cannot arbitrarily direct their discontinuance, merely because, in accordance with its own views of policy, it has ceased to collect the transit duties which formerly formed a part of its revenue. So this passage encapsulates the complexities of preserving colonial commercial interests in Western India, where rule was predicated on such inherited rights. Um, therefore, for their, you know, for their claim to carry weight for, um, to authority in the region, um, it was necessary to assert a respect for, as this passage states, ancient rights of sovereignty this is in particular because their own authority was frequently leveraged through assertions of having inherited their own powers through treaties from preceding powers in the region. Um, for their own authority to remain inviolated, the British had to respect the contemporary claims of other powers, at least to a certain degree and on paper. In this case, the rights of the ruler of Baroda and the rulers of other Western Indian princely states to levy their own transit duties. The passage continues, however, to consider whether or not those particular sovereign rights didn't did in fact exist. And in other words, acknowledge, while acknowledging their inability to violate ancient rights of sovereignty, the Revenue Department determines that they must ascertain the origin of the claimed right of the Gakwar to levy transit duties. And if their origin does not align with the colonial government's definition of an ancient right of sovereignty, so to speak, then they were well positioned to pressure the ruler to abolish his duties. Such sources as this were, vi were vital to my own research and understanding how the colonial government asserted power in Western India and how they negotiated authority with the independent states. This particular source contributed toward the development of a clearer picture of how an integrated regional economy might have been developed. Such records can also illustrate the oftentimes conflicted role played by British residents as mediators between the princely and colonial governments. It was in one such report from July 1874 that I uncovered a missive decrying the excessive salt smuggling and salt manufacturing in violation of British prohibition of such activity. Often the central authorities, both in, in India and at home, would communicate rumors of smuggling and the like to the residents in the hopes of having the rumors either confirmed or denied. Now, this kind of correspondence is most useful when used in conjunction with many of the documents that are actually available here. While many of what I have used in my own research has been drawn from later series, um, being documents transferred later or from the presidency departments and frontier posts, I did also make great use of these materials. Together, they contextualize the more granular reports and give a sense of how they were employed toward the official governance of the presidency and British Indian governments. Now, this current um, release makes, avail makes available a great many documents of immense value. In particular, the, um, the East India Company's charters, statutes, and treaties have been incredibly important for ascertaining the political context within which the economy of Western India developed. Most importantly, since, as previously stated, many of the debates and negotiations that underpinned the expansion of British commercial interests beyond the boundaries of British India and the development of an integrated princely British economy drew upon their statutes and treaties, it was important that I be similarly informed. For example, 
in the 1802 treaty with the Murata Peshwa, known as the Treaty of the Same, which um, I believe you can see on your screens now, is contained within this series. Now, this treaty, alongside another one with between the East India Company and the Murata Peshwa from 1817, restricted the powers of the Peshwa as ruler of the defeated Murata Empire and outlined those territories, rights, and privileges that were ceded to the British. In particular, the 1817 treaty circumscribed the Peshwa's relations with other foreign rulers, European or Indian. It prohibited him from entering into any negotiation with any foreign authority without the express consent of the British colonial government. It, moreover, demanded that the Peshwa dismiss from court any representatives of any power, European or Indian, that was not friendly toward British interests. These treaties also, quite importantly, defined those successor states and powers that emerged following the disintegration of Maratha power. Most notably included in this category was the state of Baroda, ruled by the Gakors. Formerly subsidiary of the Maratha Empire, the 1817 treaty established the independence of Baroda and created a newly independent authority in the somewhat turbulent Gujarati region. The treaty also redistributed the land revenue that had previously belonged to the Peshwa between the Gakors and the British. Now, the inclusion of this measure is not wholly surprising, given the clearly well-established alliance between the Gakors and the company by 1817. In 1802, um, the Gakors signed a definitive treaty of general defensive alliance with the East India Company, which is also available um, in this module. And um, I believe we also have, yes, perfect. Um, now, this treaty has stated that friends and enemies of either party shall be the enemies of both and committed both sides to intervention in any conflicts with outside aggressors. The Gakwa likewise agreed to receive a permanent subsidiary force of not less than 3,000 regular native infantry with one company of European artillery. The force was officially on paper intended for the defense of the Gakwa's interests. It offered him sounding military force without having to find the funds to support it from his own coffers. On the other hand, he was required to maintain a foreign force that would ultimately prioritize British interests within his own territories, thereby ceding a certain measure of independence and security from British incursions. So through the Treaty of Bassein and the 1817 Treaty with the Peshwa, the British managed to not only ensure that the Maratha Empire could no longer pose a, a political or military threat to the British, but also established semi-independent, friendly successor states, preventing any alliances in the region that could undermine colonial agendas. This extended toward trading agreements as the British sought to monopolize trade and industry and gave the British an undeniable dominance within interstate politics. Now, these few samples drawn from my own research are but a few examples of the many sources available in the India office records, and many of which I have made use of at various points in time. There's a great deal available that I have not mentioned today. And available in this first release, for example, are the minutes of the Court of Directors, for example, which have featured heavily in my more recent work on the Lever Home Trust project, Snapshots of Empire, which seeks to reconfigure our understanding of British imperial governmentality. As a team, myself and my colleagues have been analyzing all the incoming and outgoing correspondence of the India and colonial offices, including the minutes of the Court of Directors of the East India Company for certain finite periods of time. This methodology provides an approach that narrows the temporal frame of analysis and expands the spatial, emphasizing interconnectivity and simultaneity rather than chronological succession. I mentioned this very different kind of project in passing here at the end of this brief talk to simply emphasize the wide variety of materials available and the vast array of applications to which they may be put. These materials can offer insights into small-scale interactions on the fringes of British India, war and diplomacy across the East India Company's territories, and the, po the political machinations of the company as it took control of the subcontinent, and the ways in which the imperial government sought to manage company activities in India and elsewhere within a global context. Thank you very much. I think, carry on really from that last point, there, there is a real emphasis, I think, more and more we're finding scholars are wanting to look at, if I just click into the documents list here, are wanting to look at, uh, you know, rather than classes B, you know, the, the set of minutes from the court directors, look at uh, in the more municipal or provincial uh, standing committees or memoranda from 
I suppose, local pockets or, or local um, factions that were formed as, you know, to use a, a phrase from Kay, at the, the fringes of British India. And I really think that as well as looking at, you know, the high level class B material, the core of directors, minutes, particularly that, um, I suppose, um, when they were really solidifying power at the, at the start of the 18th century, there is endless uh, research ideas here for looking at that those more provincial or municipal um, parts of power as well, um, particularly in that in that class uh, D class. So just something to to bear in mind there. And Kate's work, you know, explores this you know, extremely well. There's a there's a group at Sussex, and I, I do urge you they have a really good blog. Um, which you'll be able to find uh, either through Kate's Twitter or um, or through the University of Sussex History Department website as well. So I'd urge you uh, to take a look at that as well. So now uh, we have um, two people who, who I mentioned have been very instrumental to helping this uh, this project really kind of come to life in digital form. And those people are uh, Margaret Makepeace and Penny Brook from the British Library. Okay, so I'm Penny Brook, Head of the India Office Records. Um, the documents included in the Adam Matthew online resource are incredibly important because they reflect the major interests of the East India Company from 1600 to 1857, and then the India Office from 1858 to 1947. I regard them as being a major part of what I think of as the backbone of the nine miles of the India Office Records. The archives of the International Trader and the Jewel in the Crown of Empire provide remarkable insights into British and world history. As you would expect from their name, the India Office records relate mainly to South Asia, present-day India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. However, they also reflect the company's trading interests in China, Japan and Southeast Asia, and the importance of St Helena and the Cape as stopping off points on the journey between Britain and Asia. The Middle East and Central Asia, particularly Afghanistan, were strategically important for both institutions and European rivalries were played out overseas. The records in the Adam Matthew resource therefore tell you about the broad sweep of history and major events such as the abdication of King Edward VIII. Um, so I've brought this up on the screen here, the instrument of abdication. This document is one of six that Edward VIII signed on Thursday the 10th of December 1936. It led to the Act of Parliament which effected his abdication on the following day after a reign that had lasted for less than a year. The document was delivered to the Secretary of State for India, the Marquis of Zetland, by virtue of the King's position as Emperor of India, a title held by the reigning monarch since 1877. Recognising the document's historical importance, the record keepers at the India office added it to their parchment records, a collection which included the charters of the East India Company and other royal proclamations. The East India Company and the India office relied on their employees in Britain and overseas to conduct their business effectively and worked hard to ensure that they were properly accountable for their decisions and actions. They endeavoured to maintain control through detailed record keeping, creating what Hugh Bowen has described as an empire in writing that tells fascinating stories of individuals as well as illuminating the big picture. I personally love the way these individual stories provide insights into the impact of history on everyday life, continuity as well as change and sometimes challenge preconceptions. I have therefore selected examples that challenge a common but oversimplified view of the company as an organisation that cared only for profit. They also challenge the perception that attitudes to mental health in the 19th century were entirely barbaric. My examples both come from IOR slash D slash 7, which are the... Um, these are the minutes of the Committee of Correspondence, 1819 to 1821. The volume contains a number of references to the activities of Dr. George Rees, and he was responsible for the care of people described as insane who had returned from service in India. 
and the company made several payments relating to the care of these people. And you can see that on the right-hand side of the screen, we have the index entry for Dr. George Rees. And on the left-hand side, we have an entry for the 4th of October, 1820, relating to Richard Fudge, who having been restored to health, was given five pounds to enable him to travel to his friends in Plymouth. And then there's a further example um, relating to the care of these patients. At the, foot of, at the top of page 876, um, the minutes refer to a note from Dr. Reese explaining that one of the insanes placed under his care by the company is very dangerously ill and that the use of wine is absolutely necessary for him. Dr. Reese also submitted a list of clothing required for other patients and the expenditure on both items was approved. The committee also agreed that a violin be provided for the use of Mr. Frederick Heisen, also one of the patients under the care of Dr. Rees. It seems that the company recognised that afflicted individuals required more than basic feeding, clothing and accommodating, and in some cases were prepared to pay for more thoughtful treatment. Profit was undoubtedly an overriding concern for the company, and no doubt many people with mental health issues suffered terribly in the 19th century. But these examples provide a more nuanced view of what was happening and illustrate the importance of primary sources such as these for gaining fresh insights into history. I'm now going to hand over to Margaret Makepeace. Hello, I'm Margaret Makepeace and I'm lead curator for the East India Company Records. The first document I've chosen is taken from an early volume of the court minutes IOR B2. It shows the first page of the instructions given by the East India Company to Henry Middleton before he sailed as principal commander of the second voyage in 1604. In its early years, the East India Company was interested in challenging the Dutch for a share of the commercial opportunities offered by the Spice Islands of Southeast Asia. So Middleton's fleet of four ships was to sail to Java, a long and tedious voyage according to the directors. The instructions cover a variety of subjects. Middleton was advised to inspire both love and fear in the men he commanded, whilst taking care of their safety, health and comfort. Prayer services were to be held daily, and sailors disciplined for blasphemy and idle and filthy communication. Unlawful gaming was banned, especially playing dice. Directions were provided to assist Middleton in keeping his ships together for their better protection until the port of Bantam was reached. Clear procedures were laid down for the procurement of a return cargo. Private trading was forbidden, but sailors were allowed to bring home a small quantity of china dishes or light trifles. Company men could make their fortunes if their voyages were successful, but the risks were high. Disease as well as ship losses took a heavy toll on lives. Henry Middleton and his brother David prospered in company service, but both died during expeditions to Asia. Now move on to my second document, which is taken from the court minutes in 1818. Rather than taking us on a journey to Asia, this leads us into East India House in London. It talks about some of the few women to be employed as company servants, the housekeeper Elizabeth Tarrant and her three assistants. Up to July 1818, these four women had lived in East India House with their families, as well as accommodation, they were provided with allowances for coal, candles, table beer, tea and sugar. The directors now decided that it was inconvenient to have so many people living at its London headquarters and that it would be quite sufficient to have just the housekeeper and one assistant on the spot. Elizabeth Tarrant's present rooms were wanted for the assistant secretary, so she was to have a book room on the third floor fitted out for her in a convenient manner. Assistant Lucy Imson was allotted two rooms in East India House. Her husband, George, had recently joined the company London warehouses as a labourer. Four children were born to the couple whilst they were living at East India House, the first just two months after this minute was written. The other two women were to move out, but they received compensation, £30 a year at each in addition to their salary. They were instructed to find lodgings as close as possible to East India House so they could attend punctually to the business of the tea rooms provided for the company employees. And I think this document reminds us 
the company records are a treasure trove for the history of London and its people, as well as for the history of Asia. And that's the, our last example. So we hand back. And I think, really, I'm, I'm, I just wanted to sort of give a few closing words, really. Um, you know, we've seen some really nice examples of, of not only some treaties, but some sets of minutes from uh, Penny and Margaret there uh, from the, the Class B and, and D records. And I've likely skimmed over a few ways uh, that, that you can access uh, this material. Um, you know, we said most of this is manuscript, so I would encourage you to to use those indexes we've seen, use the filters, and, and you know, if you are looking for something in particular, um, then that that may have been indexed or appears in the metadata, you can run a search. But just wanted to make it clear that you know this is a vast resource, and you may need to put a bit of time into into um, thinking about how to get to the particular material that you're looking for. And that is it from me, really. I realize we're, we're a few minutes over now. Um, so just, I just want to take ta the time to say a massive thank you to Dr. Kate Bohm uh, from the University of Sussex, and then uh, Dr. Margaret Makepeace and Penny Brook from the British Library as well. And that is it from me. Um, please do look out for the recording uh, in your inbox over the next few days. Get in touch if you have any questions or if you need any clarifications. Uh, or if you'd like maybe a bespoke webinar for, for you and your colleagues um, or, or, or any inf information at all, please do let us know. And uh, let us know if, you, if you're interested in a free uh, trial as well. They're, they're no obligation and they'll hopefully give you a, a better chance just to click around and get to know the material a bit better.